Really? Okay. Yeshar Koach. Okay, Ari. Thank you. Michael, 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 Michael. Okay. Now that we finished that, um, okay. yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in the group again. Um, it's been uh, some time, so it's really beautiful to be here. Um, so our, our noset today, our subject uh, to try to decipher and to delve into, God willing, uh, we'll attempt in the next 20 to 30 minutes, and I'll open up for questions, um, to um, delve into this idea of Hashem which we know uh, is, is found everywhere and anywhere, but there is this inyan, there is this idea that Hashem um, is most readily found in Adar. Because why? How do we know that? Because the calling of, of the energy of this month is to serve Hashem from a place of simcha. And of course, behold, but, you know, in every Hag, we have this instruction to serve Hashem be simcha, but this is the month, Adar is the month, where it's not just a matter of, um, you know, having a general umbrella instruction uh, to be Basimcha, but there's one very specific day, the day of Purim. And on that day, the instruction is there's a mitzvah to be Basimcha. And we know that the instruction to serve Hashem is Eve do it Hashem Basimcha. So from here, we could conclude that service of Hashem is very, very much connected to the idea of being Basimcha, which means that in this month, there is this ability to connect to Hashem in a way that is not necessarily always available to us um, throughout the year. So we want to we wanna discover, we want to go into this a little bit, we want to see how we can find Hashem through the energy of this month, through the nuances of this month, so let's let's go ahead and let's try to unravel some of this. And a lot of this we know, we know, but we know that the Chachamim and our sages teach us and they say you have to learn something 101 time for it to begin to pierce through the Sechel, through that that um, skull of ours. And there's a reason why they call it brainwash, because you have to wash down your brain literally sometimes 101 times until you can actually absorb a certain message. So even if these are things that we have heard of, Let's see if we can go about it through different angles because I'm here teaching myself and you all are just um, uh, tapping into an intimate conversation that Arit Esther is having in her own mind and within herself every moment of the day. So we know that there are two manifestations through which Hashem interacts with creation. Um, there's the hiddenness and there's the revealed, right? Galut is the hiddenness and Geula is the revelation. But there are also two personas that really depict this manifestation of Hashem's presence in the world and the way he goes about um, bringing about his interaction with the universe, right? There's Yosef HaTzadik, Yosef HaTzadik, through which we know there's this revealed um, ability to tap into um, the beauty of Hashem's re revealed presence in the world. We know well, that Yosef HaTzadik is, is, uh, is defined as being a man of beauty to the point where all of uh, Eshet Potiphar's servants would um, take one look at him and would literally cut their fingers off. I mean, while chopping vegetables because he was just so magnificently beautiful. So we know here that Yosef Atzadik basically represents, and we also are told, of course, him wearing this kutonet pasim, this beautiful robe of, of colors. Um, and, and so his whole inyan is beauty. The revealed glory, glorified uh, presence of Hashem's beauty. And then we have also Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu really depicts this world, this olam of uh, olam hanistal, this hidden world. And we know that Hashem, that Hashem revealed himself to Moshe Rabbeinu in a cloud. We'll get to that in a minute. We know that um, Moshe Rabbeinu had to also, of course, that's where he was able to also get, um, you know, receive the Torah. We also know that when he descended downward, he was glowing. He was glowing, but he was almost covered in this veil to hide this glow because it was a glow that none of us was a were, were able to stand in, 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 in the face of his awesome light. So we understand uh, from this that there are two ways that Hashem basically comes to us in this world. And Rabbi Nachman also brings about this whole idea that there's, there's good, which is revealed good. And then there's not bad, but there's hidden good, 
which to us, we perceive hidden good as it being bad. Really, in essence, there is no bad. Bad, we need to redefine what we assume to be as bad. And bad is really good that's not revealed yet to us. That's not yet shown in its fullest form to any of us. So um, we're we're basically we have this interaction with Hashem on those two manifest uh, two two levels, and the question is being asked: So what's better? What 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 is the better reality, or what serves us better? Or in essence, where do we feel Hashem more? Do we feel Him more when He's so to speak revealed, or can we? And here I'm already almost hinting to the answer. Can we, after going through a process, actually feel Hashem more through the plane of hiddenness? And on Sheikh Knesset Hagadola, the great assembly of, of our sages, tell us that Be'etzim, in actuality, we will actually feel Hashem more through the Yagata Umatsata Ta'amin, which is do the work, and then you shall find Hashem, and, and in that you will own and believe in. And through the avenue of Hester, through the avenue of, of hiddenness, in other words, through the reality called exile, we will actually be able to find and have a deeper revealed connection and relationship with Hashem than that which would be just openly revealed to us and for us to, you know, have it all full blown um, in front of us. And so really what this teaches us is that there's a level, there's a shlav, there's something that I need to have to do in order to get to that place where I'm going to skip over, right, this hump called hiddenness. And, and grab onto something that is so much more greater and so much more worthwhile, our work. And that, and that will essentially bring out to us this ultimate beautiful gift of revelation of Hashem. Exile is the home place, our reality, the Metsias and the reality that we are in today is the best place. So too, our Chachamim tell us and our Hasidic masters teach us, it is the primary um, foundation through which we can do this avoda of revealing Hashem. We need the exile. The exile motivates us. The exile creates a, a, a level of discomfort. It creates this, this constriction, squeezes out of us the ability for us to look around in the universe and say, Mi asakol eile. who's behind this all? Because at the end of the day, when a person is left with such question marks and left probing reality and poking and pulling and pushing at reality, we're, we're seeking and we're searching, all of that leads us to, to Hashem. Now, yes, some of us take the long road, but it does eventually lead us into that that place called um the place called hashem and what we what we end up getting to is we end up in the chachamim give a, a beautiful analogy the chachamim tell us our sages teach us chazal teach us that when we touch any part of reality that feels like it's falling apart that it feels to us that it's disintegrating, but not just disintegrating. When we touch a part of reality that really doesn't even show any sign of its originating, originating um, essence, and, and the example is a seed. The example is a seed. When we plant a seed, we all know that not only does it have to be planted way, 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 way into the ground, but it has to go through a complete disintegration of its essence in order for something else to be revealed. But in essence, if you took a little remnant of that original seed, you would find in it the same mechanism, the same DNA atomic, subatomic structure, 
as that which has grown from it. You could take the tree and the branches and the blossoms and the fruits and whatever it is that's growing from that, that grew from that seed. And in essence, it's showing you the same, the same structure of essence, of existence, and it proves that it came from that disintegrated seed. Now, interestingly enough, the word for seed in Hebrew, and again, I always encourage everybody to learn the Hebrew language because you really can't decipher reality from a Torah perspective unless you essentially are able to understand the Hebrew language. When you say the word seed in Hebrew, and I've said this before, how do you say seed? Zerah, zerah, right? Of course, it also is reminiscent of the idea of the sperm. That also is the potential of something else to be grown out of it. And we know that a child does not reserve, resemble in any which way, shape, or form the way that a sperm looks like when you look at it under the microscope, right? So we understand that there's this transformational process that essentially the initial, the origination of that which will create an outgrowth, the outgrowth will look completely different, completely different from the original, the origin from which it was, it, it, it all began. But the word zera is ze ra, ze ra. So the origin, the place from which things seem to be coming out of can in our limited minds can be perceived as though it is something bad, but it's not. Obviously it's not. It's there in order for it to create. The process might feel very constricting and yes, very, very tightening and hellish and anguishing and agonizing and all those other words that we may find ourselves using me including in, in our lifetime. But at the end of the day, there is, there is something about the outgrowth that still represents the origin from which it was, it, it was taken out of. And we are supposed to get to that origin. Through everything that we go through in life, we are meant to trace back to the essence of where it all began. It's supposed to lead us back to, again, probe reality, break it apart. The disintegration is meant for us to see the disparate pieces, to see the duality of, of creation, and for us to weave it all back into its original unifying force from which it originated from. Again, if we're looking at the whole idea of of Adar and Purim and our reality, our 5,784 years of reality. One of the things we're going to reveal to ourselves is that this process from hiddenness to revelation, that's really, that's the mechanism of life. And that's what Purim depicts for us. We're going to see it also through the letters, how Anybody who's followed Oramuna knows that I love to play Scrabble and I love to unravel things. And that's become almost somewhat the basis of a lot of the classes that I also teach. But let's, let's start with just a little teaser, okay? Torah, Torah is called in Aramaic, Oraita. Oraita. Oraita, the word or, because Torah, who o, he o, right? Torah is the light. It's the light. How did Moshe Rabbeinu have to? have to, what, what, what was the, the derech, what was the pathway through which Moshe Rabbeinu brought down Torah into the world? He had to meet Hashem in a very specific energy field called an anan, called a cloud. In order to receive the light, it needed to be given to us in a place called a cloud, an anan. Let's take apart this word anan. Let's take apart this wor word in Hebrew called cloud, Anan. The first letter that spells Anan is Ayin. What that means is, is that in every cloud, in this place of, so to speak, hiddenness, darkness, right? We need to open up our Ayin, our eyes. 
we need to be able to see things differently, even though we're seeing this cloud and this darkness, this hovering over of this klipa, this husk, whatever you want to call it, this hiddenness. We're being called upon when we meet the clouds of life to be able to look at it to almost, I want to say, take a second look. You know how you, you, you look at something and then you turn away and then you have to look back at it. And hopefully the second time you look at it, you'll be able to see something differently. Well, we're called upon to take a second look into our reality. What are we supposed to see? Let's go to the next letter. The next letter is, interestingly enough, the, the next two letters are the same letter, nun and nun. But one is a, is a, is a regular nun, right? It's a nun, a middle nun. What is this middle nun? So this middle nun, every letter, by the way, has its positive and negative connotation. But the, the first um, idea of nun is not only can it be, of course, the Shara Nun and the place of where we escape um, all regimens and limit, limitations and constrictions of life, but the Nun, Hazal teach us one of the reasons why in Ashray there is no Pasuk that starts with the letter Nun is because Nun automatically reminds us of this idea of Nifila, of falling. And so Ashray, because Ashray is, is this Tfila that's meant to, of course, lift us up to prepare us for the Shmon Isle. So Hazal have decided we're, we're not going, we're going to exclude anything that reminisces this idea of Nifila because we want to elevate. The whole idea is to elevate into Shmon Isle. So Nun, when we go into an Anan, when we go into these cloudy places, these dark places in our lives, we need to be able to look at the nifilot. We need to be able to look at the things that feel fallen, that feel downtrodden, the things that feel very disparate and, and, and not corrected and painful in our lives. And what are we supposed to do with it? And again, there's always a flip side because lechan lechan, everything is parv in this world and everything can be deciphered differently. In fact, is that's why we play Scrabble is because we take the letters of our reality, the words, the letters that make up the words, that make up the sentences of our reality, the way we've defined them, and we can switch them all around and we can define a completely different reality for ourselves, which is what we're really meant to do. So if we take this nun, all those nifilot, all those parts in our lives, and we change our attitude and we say, okay, you know what? Let me try to look at it from a different perspective. What, what can we see? We can see the nun as it being a place of Shara Nun, the place of the 50 gates of freedom, where we have a freedom of choice, where we can define things differently, where we could see the Nun and the Neshama, we could see the Nun in Emuna, we could see the Nun of it being a place of resilience and of strength, of Nisim, of miracles, of anything can happen here. So that is essentially the middle ground that we need to be trying to go into when we meet those cloud, cloudy places, I want to say, in our lives. And eventually when we do that work, where do we arrive? At a very different place in Shah Hanun, a very different place in, in the 50th gate, gate of freedom, of that reality of, of freedom. That Nun is now a strong, a straight line of strength that touches Deep, deep, deep. It's, a, it's a, a letter that goes very much down below. So it's still, I'm still here down below. I'm still feeling the reality of the downness of my life, but it's more straight. There's more emet flowing through it because nun reminisces the vav, which vav is the letter of emet, of, of truth. There's more truth flowing through it. There's um, more resilience. There's more strength. There's more transcendence. There's a straightness. There's I don't, I'm not being side curved. I'm able to see things as they are. And so essentially, that is what it means to meet those ananim, to meet those places of cloud, so to speak, in our lives. We're, we're going through a process where we have to change the way we see things. We have to be able to uplift ourselves from the original processes of thinking that this is all down, uh, fallen, not good. And we need to be able to stand more tall, with more strength, 
with more resilience to be able to see that there's truth here and that there's light here and that if we can do this, if we can stay in that place, we'll be able to merit to embrace the araita, the light and the, 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 the ways, literally the map of life called Torah. And that's essentially the secret of Adar. The secret of Adar is to see the or. Yes, Adar, Aleph, Dalit, Resh. The, the first letter is Aleph. The last letter is Resh. And there is or where in the Delet. If we open up the door in this month, if we open up the, the consciousness to be able to understand that even though Hashem is not, so to speak, revealed in the Megillah, but the Megillah is a gilui. It's telling us there is what to, to, to reveal to us. There are, in the hiddenness, we know, there are messages here that we can find Hashem. There is or in, da, in, in Adar. But how, again, look, I'm going back to the Anan. How can I find it? Switch the letters around of or is Reish Aleph, Re'eh. I have to have Yira. I have to be able to see Hashem. But even more so, look at this beautiful um, chiddush that's also brought to us from the Kabbalistic teachings. We know that in Purim, that we, in order to be Makayim the mitzvah, to fulfill the mitzvah of Purim, we have to get to a place where, so to speak, we're drunk. Yes, we all have the permission to drink on this beautiful day. Women, bitzniyut, but men, you know, I guess more, more revealed in a more revealed way. And by the way, there are hidden reasons to that as well, but we won't get into that. But the idea is we need to get to a place, adeloyada, right? And where is that place? That place is in Keter. That's the place that hovers over us at a level of, of you know, the auric field, right? On top of the head. And in, in, uh, in Kabbalistic terms, it's called Radla. Radla. Radla stands for Reisha Delo et Yada. Delo Yada, Delo et Yada. It's a place, it's a Rosh. Reisha is, is the Rosh, the head that doesn't know. Right? We have to get to that place where I have to say on Purim, I know nothing. What do I know? But look what it says there also in this Radla. If you take the letters uh, that spell this super conscious state where I could say, I know nothing. I absolutely know nothing. And I could be okay with that. But not only can I be okay with that, I can actually laugh. I can actually laugh at my Mitzvah and say, you know what? I know nothing. That's quite hysterical. I know nothing. Ha, ha, ha. I know nothing. And not only that, I can celebrate it. And not only that, I, I don't have to hide behind it anymore. I could be proud of the fact that I know nothing about my reality. And not only that, but that's completely aligned with the reality that Hashem wants me to know. That means really getting to a place of drunkenness, getting to a place where I can say I, I don't know anything is actually the way I should be living my life every single day. Every single day I should be saying I know nothing and I should be laughing at that and kind of finding the humorous side to it. That, that in itself is an avoda, but just to be reminded of that is in itself freeing because that's really the reality that Shem wants us to know about. But when you take the letters of Radla, again, you have within it Reish, Dalit, Lamed, Aleph. Again, you have the Or. There's light there. But how do you get to that light? How can you get to that place where you could say, I know nothing. Look at the hint that's written in the Radla is Dalet Lamed are the two letters that are found inside Radla. Dal, a person must seize the attribute, the, the most virtuous attribute of humility. We need to be able to be okay saying, I know nothing. And I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay with saying, I know nothing. And I have to be able to let go and let God. Because part of what happens when a person is drunk 
is that they really relinquish control. They, they say, I'm out of control. Who's the person that drinks? The one who says, I have no control. It's an escape mechanism. Not that I'm encouraging everybody to go and drink and be silly all day long. But think about what happens when you do drink. You let go. You have no control over your reality. You have no control over your reality. And you're okay with that because you're realizing that you're basically handing over the keys of your consciousness to somebody else. And whoever that somebody is, that's the people in the room, the people who are witnessing this silliness. But at the end of the day, you're realizing it's coming to this place of realizing that we really, really have no control whatsoever. So Adar give, is the, the preparation for Purim is recognizing that I have no knowledge. I have no idea what Hashem is really planning for me or planning for the universe, or has in store for any of us. I have no idea how he's going to switch things around, Keharif Ayin, because Mashiach comes only Keharif Ayin. I know we all have very, very, very big, high hopes that God willing, this, this Pesach, this Purim, I mean, everything seems to be so aligned with Mashiach right now. But the truth is, Mashiach comes Keharif Ayin. We have no, when we're all looking the other way, that's when we're, our heads will be turned around and we'll be able to say, what? Has, has, how did he come? Like, I didn't know that. We will be taken by surprise. And that's what Purim is teaching us, that all the revelations of life, all the revelations of that which will turn out to be so magnificent and so beautiful it's all going to be coming through the back door. It's all going to be coming from a place that we didn't plan, that we had no knowledge of, that we, we completely gave over the keys over to Hashem and, and we're letting him, so to speak, run the show. And we know this, we know this when we talk about Amalek. Because when we talk about Amalek, we are given a promise in the written Torah we are given a promise that Hashem is going to be the one who's going to obliterate the name of Amalek. We have to just stand by. Hashem yilachem lachem v'atata You remain quiet. Let Hashem finish the wars, our own personal battles, the battles of the world, the battles of all the, the, the nations, you know, treading up against the Chas Shalom that will all be obliter obliterated by Hashem. El Nekamot Hashem. Hashem is the God of vengeance. He is going to be the one who is going to completely nullify all these forces. It's only up to us to say, I have no idea, Hashem. I won't even know. I, have, I, I can't know and I will not know. There's a level of unknowingness that I just have to be okay with. I want to bring about another point that I feel is also so important. That's also hidden into the whole idea of Purim. And again, Adar is sort of the preparation, right? The preparatory work to get to that place of Purim. There are five levels of Gvura in the world. There are five levels of severity that are hidden inside the world. These five levels of severity, these five levels of gavura are found in the five end of letters in the alphabet. There are 22 letters and then there are five end of letters, right? The five otiot sofiot, what we call in, in short mansapach, right? Mem, nun, tzaddik, pei, and kaf. They're all five letters that are end of letters. And Kabbalistic teachings teach us, the Arizal brings down, that they represent Gvurot. They represent five levels of hiddenness, of judgment, of severity, where the Chesed of Hashem are, so to speak, hidden. And yes, that means that anybody who has any one of these five letters in their name, yes, it could mean that they might be more judgmental, they might be a little bit more pessimistic in their lives. They might tend to be 
um, uh, feeling more constricted in certain avenues in their lives. However, don't despair. We're going to get to the good parts of it. But yes, the original, the origin of these letters, they really do stem. Um, if we actually add the gematliot, the gematliot of each one of the letters, they actually equal 280. And 280 equals par, pay resh which is basically stems again Kabbalistically to the 280 klipas, the main klipas, the main shells that sort of shard off and, and cover up the original light, the Oregon news. Again, I'm not going to get into it, but the bottom line is that there is constriction. There is constriction. But why am I saying uh, that it equals 280 and it equals par? Because what we learn from here is that all words, that have in them the two letters pay and reish, they basically hold within it and represent a certain level of, of restricted and constricted energy. Again, severity, denim, constriction, concealment, hiddenness, and all that. Let's take an example of some words. Para, para, para aduma, right? Perud, separation. Kapara. Right, when we say a kapara it has pay and resh, Purim has pay and resh, Paras, Iran, Persia have within it also a pay and resh. So we see from here, again, Lachanu Lachan, we see from here that the any words that have these two letters in it could somehow introduce more so into our lives this idea of hiddenness. And yet, and here's the don't, and yet, and yet, Hasidu teaches us that within them, we are also given the profound, profound ability to restore these 280 constrictions, these par dinim. We have the ability to bring them back and restore holiness through them. We have the ability. When we do our work down here, that's the yigia, that's the work. When we perfect ourselves down here, that is the way to restore these shards that cover up the most elevated levels of holiness and light. We have the ability to bring all that back to its original Oregon news, to reveal this beautiful light from within it. And that is where Purim comes in. It's on Purim. If you and I, we could prepare ourselves getting up to Purim, we're going into Rosh Chodesh Adar Bet. If we could prepare ourselves and already now wear that cap, wear that costume, wear that mask, so to speak, and, and say to Hashem, I have no idea. I have a Rosh Shaloyodea. Klum. I have a head. That knows nothing. Everything that I thought I knew, everything I thought that I defined for my life, everything that I have defined as being good or bad, guess what? In the world of Reisha de lo et yada, in that world of Keter consciousness, in that world where I would have to, so to speak, get drunk to get into that world, but I can even attain it now by just saying, I know nothing. You know everything, Hashem, and that's enough for me. That's enough for me to know, Hashem, that you know everything. I don't have to know everything. As long as you, the driver of my life, the driver of the bus that I'm now a passenger on, as long as you're driving me to a destination that you know where I'm going, I'm okay not knowing. I'm okay not knowing. And that is the cap that I need to wear. And that is the consciousness that I need to attain. Because when I do, and when we do, we're in Purim all day long, all life long. Now, again, these are ideals. I'm not saying any of us could really stay in that consciousness 24-7. But can we tap into it a little bit more every day during Adar to, to open up that Delet for that Aleph Reish, for that Or, for that light to come in and to say to Hashem, from the Gvura, from the Gvura, from the place of constriction, can I allow that openness? Can I be in that place of Dalut Ruach, 
that place of humility to say, I have no idea what it is that you're planning. I have no idea how in the blink of an eye you can bring about the revelation of goodness that's being hidden here right now. Absolutely, I can. I have to do that avoda. I have to break through in my consciousness to just know and recognize that I know nothing. Because when I can, when I can, when you can, and the more times that we can leading up to Purim, then we will be able to tap into that enormous light that's going to be revealed to each and every one of us on this day of Gvura, of the pay, pay resh, of this Pardinim. Within Purim, there are Dinim. But if I can, the way to exit out is for me to say, I know nothing. So let's prepare ourselves today to get to as many times throughout the day when you're dumbfounded. Hey, we're all dumbfounded. We have no idea what's going on in reality right now. We have literally no, no idea. But the more times that we can get to a place where you and I could say, Hashem, I know nothing. I'm going into Radla. I'm into Radla mentality now. I have no idea what's going on. We are in Purim. We are essentially escaping reality. And let me tell you one last thing. You know what's in that Rosh de Loya et Yada? You know what's in there? That world is beyond definition. That world is Olam Shukulotov. That is a world where everything is good because it's beyond definition. It's beyond logic. There is no good and bad in the, that Rosh de Loya et Yada. There's only I know nothing. So there's no good, there's no bad, there's no definition, there's only Hashem. And where Hashem is, you know what's there? This is the, uh, the, the, the axiom that I've been adapting myself since I came back from the Ukraine. I went with a bunch of breast levers to, uh, to the Ukraine not too long ago, about a month ago. And all we kept saying on the bus was, Yesh in yan she yitapech hakol hakol letova. We were singing it all throughout the journey because when you can get to that place where you could say, I know nothing, that's where everything can turn around. So we should get to that place of consciousness of saying, I know nothing, shed all the layers and let Hashem run the show and take us to Geula. Be'ezrat Hashem barachamim dolim. Gluim, amen, Kim Yeratzon. through which Hashem um, reveals himself in the world. He can re reveal himself through Yosef, or he can reveal himself through Moshe. It's basically just two personas of the manifestations of the revealed good and the hidden good in, of reality. So we know that Yosef Atzadik, he, he is the persona that brings upon for us the revelation of Hashem's glory, his beauty, um, you know, uh, his royalty, right? Because he, he elevated himself up to, to such, to become the, the second in command of, of Mitzrayim. So it was just, a, it's just an example of, of the two manifestations through which Hashem interacts okay. in the world. Okay, I was trying to understand. Sorry that. about that. Thank you. With pleasure. Okay, I'm just going to take two more questions. The second two people. So Charlene, go ahead. Thank you so much for that. That was very quick and simple. So you, if I was to you, well, uh, I know nothing, right? So I know Neither do I. Intellectual in my brain. I, I'm willing to do that exercise. How do I feel it? Because knowing is not feeling. It. Love it. Yeah. As you let out the debu, you create the dabar, right? Heemanti mm -hmm. ki adabel. The more I speak, the more I brainwash. As I speak, so too I hear, so too it permeates. I need to brainwash myself. Listen, at the end of the day, all of us, we're not used to this. This is not the way we were taught. We were, I mean, living a life of Amuna is completely di diametrically opposed to Western culture of logic, 
and understanding and deciphering. We're, we're learning a new way. Amuna is a new way of, of living, but you have to train, right? Amuna is lehita men. You have to train yourself. And the only way to train yourself is make that which feels new to become a habit. How do you make something a habit? You keep doing it over and over and over and over again, right? So that's the only way. There's no, there's no quick fix here. You have to just keep baking it till you're making it. And then I love to use just do it with Nike. Just keep doing it. Just keep saying it. It will permeate into your heart. Bezat Hashem. And another thing about Anan. Yes. Anan is, um, so the 70 revelations are of the Ayin. Yes. And there is a no in seeing the light or other choices. And nun is the neshama, which means I have free will, and I could I could tap into that 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 choices, and and the fifty gates of freedom are available for me, and I can go into it, and I, I can see things differently. And when I do, the last nun is things will be more straightforward for me, right? There'll be less curveballs. So, so when I say anenu in, in Yom Kippur, that means anenu. I want to have you have the vav the vav is the letter of truth which is what i said that the vav and the nun are are the same the same shape yeah okay we're going to take one more question vicky go ahead vicky your hands up vicky you have to unmute yourself okay sorry about that go ahead i think the biggest question i have in my head as i was learning today regarding um not knowing how do I convey this to my child? Like, how do I get, like, how do I influence someone else in my life to have that feeling of connection to Hashem? Such a, that's like a fascinating question. And I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, the child, the child is actually the easiest person to get to because just like, just like we ask our children to, um, to do certain things and we, we sort of anticipate or we hope uh, that they're going to do it. But why, why would you expect your child to do that which you're asking them to do? Vicki, I'm just asking you, like, why, why would... I mean, the, the, the belief is it's connecting to Hashem. No, 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 no. I'm talking about from a parental perspective. When you tell your, when you tell your child, please do this or do that, or uh, I'm telling you, I don't want you to do this, or I don't want you to do that. Why would you expect your child... To to, to to listen to you because i'm the parent well, and and what are they supposed to have towards you not just respect but so, so, something so, else not respect i mean see what i love trust I, i'm gonna go i'm gonna get straight to it because i know we're short on time you you we anticipate that the reason why our children are going to listen to us not just out of respect why do they have respect because they trust us they trust that our years on planet earth that are just one day, I always say to my kids, I'm one day older than you, you know? So that experience of being one day more on, in the universe hopefully earns them the trust that they could trust us that whatever it is I'm giving them advice for, I know what I'm saying, just a little bit more, I'm one day older than you, right? So the same thing is, is how I would explain that to my child. When, when I say the reason why I assume in our relationship, you're going to be listening to certain things that you may not agree with me on, but you're going to do them anyway, not just because of, of, of Kibbutz Ve'em, but because you trust me. You trust that I do know better or that I do have your better interest in mind. Same too, I can explain to them what it means to give over that trust to Hashem. And not only to L'chabed Oto, to honor Him, but also to trust Him that if I don't understand exactly the way things are looking in my eyes, just like I anticipate that my kids should trust me and, and honor me and fulfill my request for them, same here, I would ask that they would do the same thing, so to speak, for Hashem. Hmm. It's a big struggle. I'm, I'm struggling a lot with that. Uh, we all, I, I'll tell you why. Because our children, unfortunately, have lost respect for us as well as parents. Between me and you, they don't trust us as much as they did. I'm not, I, I don't want to get into this whole thing, but they, re, they think they know better than us. That's the problem with our generation, is they think they know better than us. So they don't trust us because they think they know better. And that also leads them to not necessarily trust and have Imun and Hashem too. By the way, it's literally parallel. It's, it's a struggle. We do the best that we can. You know, it's not... You really gave me such a great 
understanding of not knowing. Like I always do that. Like I don't know what's going on yet. I, I believe of them. I'm a trusting of them. And I always struggle between the Kaplan and Amuna. And thank you so much. Thank for you, Hashem. Giving me that information today. I needed to hear it. Thank you, Hashem. So did I. I. I taught it for myself. Like I said, you were all eavesdropping into my conversation in my head. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Nomi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, gorgeous. I will share all your information on the WhatsApp group. Thank you. So, uh, uh, well, we have a, a, tremendous, a tremendous amount to offer. And um, the Rosh Hashem, um, 